Uh, this is another way to evade it. I don't know any Jew or Christian who doesn't deny chapters in Leviticus, okay? But I find it very, very commonplace, as we had this evening, that people ignore that the hadith, the sayings of Muhammad, are pretty strong on the matter of what you do about the gays. <coughs> so Hello, welcome to my YouTube channel. Today we'll be checking out an interesting video by Douglas Murray titled, What is Islam? Wow, I believe this is going to be very educative. Let's start with the video. Go. What is Islam? We've had a lot of talk already tonight about it, and I've only got 10 minutes, so I'm very unlikely to be able to give you a comprehensive definition. If you listen to Zach, uh, Muhammad, who founded Islam, was a sort of prototype of a just especially benevolent town councillor in the region of Fife. If you listened to him, you would get the impression that it was a pure arrangement of a few minimal issues of governance and so on. Now, that isn't the case. Islam is many, many things. It's many complex things. It's not easy to sum it up. It is a religion, however, and it is possible to sum it up to some extent. My own favorite definition is that there are, in, a sen in essence, three Islams. There is the Islam of the origins, that is the text, the Quran, and the Hadith, the sayings, and indeed the early lives of Muhammad. There is the second Islam, the way in which that has been extrapolated out over the centuries in the body of law known as the Sharia. And there is a third Islam that we often mean when we talk about Islam, which is what do Muslims believe, how do Muslims live. Now these are very, very deep waters, but there isn't any point in seeing deep waters unless you plunge straight in. Zach said in his comments that we must return to Islam's religious values. But the problem is that Zach's version of Islam's religious values is going to be very different from a lot of other people's. And let me put this point to you at its hardest, but I think it's necessary and it's truthful. Groups like ISIS have the worst possible interpretation of Islam. It should go without saying. But they have the worst possible of interpretation of Islam for Muslims and for non-Muslims. However, it is an interpretation of the texts that they have. It is a valid interpretation of the lessons they take from the life of Muhammad. It is a possible interpretation of the texts and traditions they have in front of them. I'm afraid... I'm afraid, ladies and gentlemen, that Muhammad was not Buddha. He did not live his life as Buddha. The world would be a lot more peaceable if he did, but it wasn't the case. I know that Shabir said in his comments that he doesn't want us to get into comparisons with other religions, but it might just be necessary. Consider the history of, Islam, of, of Christianity, ladies and gentlemen. The history of Christianity, goodness knows, has been bloody. Would it have been more bloody or less bloody if on even one occasion when one of Jesus' disciples comes to him and says, how many times should I forgive my brother seven times or 70 times seven? If instead of saying forgive him endlessly, which is what Jesus ends up saying, he'd have said chop off his head. What would have happened to the history of Christianity if even on one occasion when a woman is brought to Jesus found in adultery, instead of saying he who is without sin cast the first stone, said stone her. I think we can all agree. We should all be able to agree in a place like this. The history of Christianity would have been bloodier. So it is with Islam. And I know that in a house like this, in this particular era, it's necessary to pretend that some people believe in Christianity, some people believe in Islam, some people do yoga, and that there isn't very much difference between them. There is, Douglas ladies Murray and gentlemen, argues the that to truly understand matter. a religion and its potential for peace or violence, one must evaluate the life and teachings of its founder. Murray compares Islam to Christianity, highlighting the stark differences between Jesus and Muhammad, and asserts that these differences have profound implications for the followers of each religion. Murray begins by acknowledging that evil can be committed in the name of any religion. History is replete with examples of atrocities carried out under religious banners, whether Christian, Muslim, or otherwise. However, he insists that it is crucial to look at the founders of these religions to understand their core messages and values. Jesus Christ, the founder of Christianity, is known for his teachings of love, forgiveness, and peace. 
he preached turning the other cheek, loving one's enemies, and forgiving those who wrong us. Jesus never led armies or waged wars. His message was one of spiritual salvation and moral integrity. In stark contrast, Muhammad, the founder of Islam, was a warlord. Historical records from Islamic sources, such as the Hadith and the Sirah, biographies of Muhammad, describe his involvement in numerous battles and military campaigns. Muhammad led his followers in armed conflicts against various tribes and cities, expanding his influence through both diplomacy and warfare. The early Islamic community under Muhammad's leadership engaged in actions that included the beheading of prisoners, the subjugation of tribes, and the imposition of Islam through conquest. This difference in the founders' approaches has significant implications for their respective religions. Christianity, following the example of Jesus, has a strong emphasis on peace and forgiveness. While Christians have certainly committed acts of violence, these actions are often seen as deviations from the teachings of Christ. On the other hand, the actions of Muhammad as a military leader and lawmaker are integral to the Islamic tradition. His life serves as a model for Muslims, and his military strategies and governance methods are studied and emulated. Statistics and modern examples further support Murray's argument. A study by the Pew Research Center found that a significant proportion of Muslims in certain countries support the implementation of Sharia law, which includes provisions for corporal punishment and the subjugation of non-Muslims. This legal framework is derived directly from the Quran and the Hadith, reflecting the practices established by Muhammad. In contrast, contemporary Christian movements that advocate for violence or theocratic rule are typically fringe and widely condemned by mainstream Christian denominations. Prominent critics have echoed Murray's concerns. Ayan Hirsi Ali, a former Muslim and outspoken critic of Islam, argues that the violent aspects of Muhammad's life and teachings are not just historical artifacts, but are actively influencing contemporary Islamist movements. In her book Heretic, she calls for a reformation within Islam, urging Muslims to critically examine and reform those elements of their tradition that are incompatible with modern values of human rights and equality. Furthermore, Islamic reformers themselves have recognized the need to address these issues. For instance, Mayajid Nawaz, a former Islamist and now a reform advocate, has spoken extensively about the need for Muslims to reinterpret and contextualize the violent aspects of their scripture and history. He argues that a literal and uncritical adherence to all aspects of Muhammad's life is incompatible with the principles of modern, pluralistic societies. Hello. Um, for my dedication, can I just ask two questions, please? Yeah. Um, it's on. So the first question I wanted to ask is, to what extent do you distinguish between how a, defi a, a term can be defined and the worst form of interpretation? So, for example, if I say, or, and, I, and I admire the fact that I support a secular state, does that mean I should advocate the worst interpretation of secularism, such as becoming a Soviet, a supporting Soviet Union? Second question I want to ask is, um, to what extent would you distinguish... Um, as you rightly say, the British Muslims being very anti-homosexual, um, um, as being tribal, following tribal cultures from South Asia, or because um, we know that that type of idea of killing homosexuality, being anti-homosexual, is not just restricted to Muslims in South Asia, but also Hindus in South Asia, Sikhs in South Asia, and Christians in African countries. Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, um, it's a very good question. I'm sorry I had so much to get through that I had to leave you with a numb arm, uh, but um, thank you for persevering. Uh, on the first of those things, no, I think that actually what the other side, by the way, did this evening was actually to essentialize Western culture. We hear a lot about the essentializing of Islam, very little about the essentializing of our culture. Immediately, Tariq Ramadan and others go on to colonialism and so on. It's as if the history of countries like ours is only one of colonialism. It's as if the rest of what we've achieved is as nothing. As for your second question, uh, this is another way to evade it. I don't know any Jew or Christian who doesn't deny chapters in Leviticus, okay? But I find it very, very commonplace, as we had this evening, that people ignore that the hadith, the sayings of Muhammad, are pretty strong on the matter of what you do about the gays. <coughs> so if we were to arrive at some kind of process of moving beyond that, you would have to start, wouldn't you, by saying, well, the, the, the main, the authoritative books and collections of Bukhari Hadith of Muhammad are not gay liberation documents any more than their women's liberation documents. 
you would start by admitting that. But we always go around the other way. We always go, no, it's, it's, a, it's a specific, it's a cultural thing. It, it, it's, it's, it's not to do with religion, it's to do with a, a particular tribal thing. Often then, it's, uh, as we hear quite often about uh, uh, this, uh, it's that the, the British and other colonial powers imported homophobia uh, to the Muslim world, which otherwise was just great with us gays. And this also is not, not a, uh, an accurate interpretation. So, I, as I say, I would urge that uh, Muslims in debating subjects like this admit what's in the texts and get beyond them fast. But uh, I'm not a Muslim. They have to do the job themselves. I just hope they do. Douglas Murray points out that the West's commitment to values such as gender equality and gay rights is in direct conflict with certain Islamic teachings. For instance, in many Islamic countries, women face severe restrictions on their freedoms. They may be required to dress modestly, often enforced by law, and are frequently subjected to male guardianship systems that limit their autonomy. Saudi Arabia, for example, only recently allowed women to drive and still imposes strict dress codes and travel restrictions on women without male permission. These practices are often justified using Islamic texts, such as the Quran and Haiti, which prescribe specific roles and behaviors for women. Similarly, the treatment of gay people in Islamic countries is a significant human rights issue. Homosexuality is illegal in many Muslim-majority countries and can be punishable by death in places like Iran and Saudi Arabia. These laws are rooted in Islamic teachings that condemn same-sex relationships. The severe penalties and societal discrimination faced by gay people in these regions starkly contrast with the increasing acceptance and legal protections for these communities in the West. While it is undoubtedly true that the vast majority of Muslims are peaceful and law-abiding citizens, this argument fails to address the problematic aspects of Islamic doctrine that inspire extremist behavior. Radical groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda explicitly cite Islamic texts to justify their actions, including violence against non-believers, the subjugation of women, and the execution of gay people. Ignoring or downplaying these doctrinal issues prevents an honest discussion about the root causes of extremism. Wow, what an interesting uh, speech by Douglas Murray. Just like uh, he rightly stated and as plain just by the title, what is Islam? Uh, Douglas Murray argued that uh, in order to be able to answer that question, what is Islam? That you have to be able to uh, evaluate uh, the life and the teachings of the founder of Islam. And we can tell in this video, Douglas Murray tried to explain uh, the founder of Islam, which is uh, Prophet Muhammad, as a warlord. And he stated some facts that during Prophet Muhammad's time, he engaged uh, in a lot of war, he conquered a lot of territory and subjugate a lot of territory that Prophet Muhammad, as, uh, as the founder of Islam, is a warlord and by nature is a violent person. And as Douglas Murray explained uh, in this video, that just as Christians follow the example of Jesus in Islam, the Muslims follow the example of Prophet Muhammad. And Douglas Murray also tried to explain that you can classify uh, Islam into three, which he talk about. Uh, he talk about the life of Prophet Muhammad. He talk about uh, the Sharia law, and he talk about the secular and uh, the current uh, Muslim we have right now. And by Douglas uh, Murray' explanation, that Christians tend to follow the example of of Jesus. And in Islam, they follow the example of Prophet Muhammad. And Douglas Murray also described Prophet Muhammad as someone who is very violent by nature. By nature, and Douglas Murray backed his argument by uh, the lifestyle of Prophet uh, Muhammad. And he explained that 
many Muslims see Prophet Muhammad as a role model. They tend to follow the, the teachings of Prophet Muhammad and they tend to emulate uh, the lifestyle of Prophet Muhammad. And knowing Prophet Muhammad is uh, a, a very violent person and there are still a lot of, of violent verses in the Quran. And most uh, most Muslim, not let me not generalize it, some radical Muslim tend to uh, contextualize uh, this violent verses in the Quran and use it for their own uh, selfish motive, for their own political interest. And they tend to recruit people to also follow this teaching and make them believe what they are fighting for or what they are doing uh, is justified by uh is justified by the adit is justified by the by the quran which is not uh which is not true so i believe uh the quran and the uh, the quran should go to a reform whereby those violence verses in the quran can be addressed and i can remember i watch uh a video where a Muslim scholar was given uh, a, a, a remark that Prophet Muhammad should not be judged by the civilization uh, we have right now. That Prophet Muhammad should not be judged by the civilization we have right now. That Prophet Muhammad should rather be judged by the civilization that, by the civilization that was in place during Prophet Muhammad's time. So I believe uh, the Muslim scholar is trying to justify that all the things that uh, Douglas Murray have stated that Prophet Muhammad engaged in during, uh, during his time are acceptable by law during his time, are acceptable by norms, are acceptable by value. So I don't know if during Prophet Muhammad's time Beheading of prisoners. I don't know if during Prophet Muhammad's time, beheading of prisoners was a norm. And, you know, uh, getting married to a lady that is, uh, getting married to a lady that is below the age of marriage, below 15, below 18. I don't know if during Prophet Muhammad's time by the civilization they are doing this time. I don't know if it is an acceptable norm. I don't really know about that. But Douglas Murray have uh, argued and addressed this issue that violent verses in the Quran and the Adit, which tell the life of Prophet Muhammad, should be should be should should go through a reform whereby those violent verses can be can be addressed by the Muslim scholars. And Drogas Murray also argued that uh, in religion, people tend to emulate uh, the life and the teaching of the founders. In Islam, the Muslims uh, see Prophet Muhammad, which is a founder, as a role model. And in Christianity, uh, Jesus is seen as an example, as a role model. So a lot of people tend to, a lot of radical Muslims tend, uh, tend to contextualize the radical verses, uh, violent verses in the Quran and the life of Prophet Muhammad tend to uh, use it for their own selfish motive, tend to use it for their own political interests. And at the end of the day, uh, they tend to uh, recruit people and make them believe what they are fighting is justified by the Quran. And we can also tell in this video that Gatsmuri also stated the fact that uh, in Islam, we have uh, uh, a lot of Islam that, you know, get offended, get offended when they say anything uh, regarding their religion. Uh, I think Douglas Murray des uh, described it as uh, Islam extremism. Those people, they tend to uh, 
become offended when people say anything against their religion or against uh, the founder of their religion. They believe you are becoming is uh, they believe you are becoming Islamophobic, and they tend to be offended. And Douglas Murray always say this that if you are living in a society, you are living in a country that you have no right to say you will not be offended. You have no right to say you will not be offended. And you have no right to resort to violence because you feel uh, you feel you are offended by someone. And Douglas Murray clearly stated that if you are in, living in a society, there is no way you will not be offended by someone. And you have no right to, 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 to decide to... Uh, respond to such offense uh to you have no right to decide to engage in such offense by fighting uh people because you believe they have said something against your religion or against the founder of your religion or you tend to believe people are becoming islamophobic douglas murray say it's not accepted it's not accepted that in a society people have freedom of speech people have freedom of expression, people have freedom of expression, then you don't have to be offended because someone is expressing his freedom of speech or his freedom of expression. Of expression. Because in a society, there is the need for people to express their, 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 their freedom of speech and their freedom of expression. Because I believe the clash of uh, different ideas can lead uh, can bring a uh, solution to a lot of problem so there is the need for you to if you don't if you are not okay with what someone said you don't need to pick offense you just have to engage in a dialogue with a person to try to address uh uh the grievance you are having over what the person uh, over what the person said so i believe in general, Douglas Murray is trying to uh, argue that in order for you to uh, say Islam is not a violent uh, religion, in order for you to uh, be able to make uh, a, a firm decision about Islam, that you have to evaluate the life of the founder and the teachings of the founder, which Douglas Murray has stated that uh, the teachings and uh, the lifestyle of Prophet Muhammad is violent. And he even mentioned a point that a lot of Muslim countries, they try to adopt the Sharia law, which in itself, the verses and the text written on it is very violent. And I can say I've really learned a lot just by listening to Douglas Murray in this video and I believe uh, you have also learned a lot so I would like to hear your comments what do you think about the facts that Douglas Murray have stated in this video keep the comments coming don't forget click on the subscribe button click on the like button do have a nice day